Good, good. If you have your Bibles, you can be, begin, if you'd like, uh, in them in Genesis chapter 12. We will um, soon be working our way to Hebrews 11. So if you uh, feel well familiar with the Genesis 12 passage, you can maybe just find your way directly over to Hebrews 11. And uh, we'll be spending a little bit more time there uh, than in Genesis 12. Last time we were together, we walked through and exposited the verses of Genesis 12 related to Abram being called by God to leave his family and to journey south to the land of Canaan. That was apparently their original destination uh, with Abram's father, Terah, but they were held up uh, by what we can only speculate. And then they settled, the Bible says, in Haran. Abram obeys God and he travels along with his wife and his nephew um, into Canaan after the fact. Once the family is settled in Haran, Abram continues moving into Canaan and he begins around the area of Shechem. <clears throat> then he moves to a mount between Bethel and Ai in each place, uh, building an altar unto the Lord, uh, indicating his desire to settle there. However, he is not able to settle. And then the Bible says he continued to move south, something that we'll consider uh, next time we are together, as well as the time after that. For the next couple of weeks, we'll be thinking through that idea of him moving south, uh, specifically into Egypt. We finished our message last week still thinking, as we have done for a couple of weeks now, about faith. Two weeks ago, we thought through the legacy of faith that we carry forward, right? We walked through that genealogy in chapter 11, recognized that we're tracing a family, a lineage, not just a physical lineage, but also a lineage of a family that had faith. And then last week, we uh, considered through the beginning here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, the object of our faith, asking the question, is the God that, that created us, is the God that redeemed us, is he not worthy of our faith? And we considered the character of the God that is asking us to have faith, asking that question, is the God that, that has that character, is the God who is who he is not worthy of our faith? And this week, I'm going to preach what is effectively an application message. Uh, basically, how this happened was when I was writing Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, the part I preached last week, which I wrote about three weeks ago, um, I finished and I had this whole long bit of application. And I looked at how many slides and how many words I had written, and I had all of this application still to do, and I said, this is not going to work. Uh, we're not going to have enough time for this. So I said, I guess we're going to make it a two-parter, and I'm going to carry over the application into a second message. And so this week is effectively that application. We have talked about the need for faith. We have talked about the God that is worthy of our faith. But what we haven't really talked about yet is the essence of our faith. What is it? What does it look like? And I told you a couple of weeks ago that Abraham's history is going to compel us to spend a good amount of time in Hebrews 11 because Hebrews 11 invokes numerous examples of Abraham's life as a picture of faith. As a matter of fact, there's many places in the scripture where we see Abraham invoked, and we're going to be going to many of them over the course of the examples of Abraham's life. We're going to go to James 2. We're going to find ourselves in Hebrews. We'll look in Romans, uh, Galatians, lots of places where Abraham's life forms a, a doctrinal example that uh, particularly Paul appeals to regularly within the epistles. And we're going to find ourselves there uh, many times. Uh, but today we get to begin, and I know we talked about it a little bit in a couple weeks ago as well, but we really get to begin exploring Hebrews 11 from this idea of the examples that are given there. We're going to spend our time in application format, thinking through the definition of faith as it's given in Hebrews 11, and then considering these early verses of Genesis 12 and what they demonstrate through Abram of the outworking of faith in our own lives. So we're going to go ahead and begin by reading that Genesis 12 passage again in verses 1 through 9. And then after that, we can just, uh, we'll, we'll travel over to Hebrews 11 and we'll park there for the rest of our time together. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. 
And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thee, unto, excuse me, unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now in a few minutes we'll connect these dots to Hebrews 11, but first I want to lay down a definition from Hebrews 11, cha uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And the question that I want to ask first is the question, what is faith? Now Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So Paul describes here, and, and uh, for those of you that were not in the Hebrew series, uh, I do um, rather unambiguously attribute Hebrews to Paul. Uh, in my earlier messages in Hebrews, I, I, it was either my book sermon or that, or that, that, that Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 sermon, um, I went through why it is I, I feel with a measure of confidence that Paul was in fact the one who wrote Hebrews. Uh, his, uh, traditionally, they say Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, modern scholarship has um, attributed it to all sorts of different possible people, um, you know, Barnabas among many others, um, but I do believe that, that it was Paul, and so I'll say Paul just because that's what's in my mind. If you don't agree with me, um, that's fine. Just, just put the person that you think in there when I say Paul, and we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll just, we'll be fine. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, right, inspired the words. Whoever the penman was, um, that's fine. I do believe it was Paul, but, you know, if you don't, that's fine. Um, it's all good. So, Paul describes the character of faith in two complementary ways here. He says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This word substance is a word which means a support, a confidence, something like a pillar or a foundation, the thing upon which other things rest. Of the five times that the word is used in the New Testament, three of those times it is in fact translated Confidence. Faith is the manifest confidence in those things for which I am hoping. And we need to be careful with this word hope as well. This word hope, when we use the word hope in our modern vernacular, it means something uh, that we are not sure about but that we want to happen. When we use that word, it often carries the idea of, of something which is a longing that we have, but it's not a confident longing. Um, if I say, uh, you know, every, every year around this time, uh, the NFL draft just happened, and uh, people start hoping that their team will be good this year. Now, for the majority of people hoping that, for the majority of teams that they support, that hope is unfounded, right? That hope is not going to happen. That hope is going to be disappointed by about, uh, you know, December of this next year. However, there, th that's how we use the word hope. It's a fearful longing of something which may or may not happen. But that is not how the Bible uses the word hope. That is not how our King James Bible translates that word. In, in our King James Bible, the word hope is not about a fearful longing, but it's about a desired expectation, a desire, in fact, with expectation, a joyful and earnest expectation of good, the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good. Hope is not something uh, that I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Hope is something that I fully expect to happen, and I'm simply waiting for it to come to pass. It's not the idea of saying, well, I hope one day I get to visit the mountains, or I hope someday I get to go travel to that country. That's the kind of hope that we think of when we think of hope. But when the Bible talks about hope, that hope is the idea that that I have a date where I'm leaving, my bags are packed, I've bought the ticket, it's punched and ready to go, and I'm simply waiting for the time to come. That's biblical hope. 
a joyful and an earnest expectation of that which has not yet come to pass, but which I fully expect will, in fact, come to pass. So when Paul says that faith is the substance, the support system, the foundation of the things that I am hoping for, the idea is that faith is the essence of what compels my expectation. Faith is the, the, the foundation in my life of what I expect to come to pass one day. Paul is not saying here that faith adds some level of expectation to things which I have no reason to believe will come to pass. Faith is not a shot in the dark. Faith is not this blind, hopeful idea that maybe it'll happen, maybe it will not. Rather, faith is an outworking of my confidence in something that I am certain will come to pass. So certain I am that it will come to pass that I'm actually going to build my life on it. That's faith. Faith is the actions that I perform in my life based upon the confidence that I have in something that has been promised. And the degree of faith that I have is manifest through the extent to which what I say I believe actually affects how I live my life. Because if it is not affecting how I live my life, the question is, well, then do I really believe it? So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Second, we see also faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the proof of deeds which have not been seen. The expectation, the waiting for, the, the longing for of that which is not seen. There's coming a day where something that is not seen, I fully expect will become a reality. And as that finds its way into my life, it does so in the manner in which I wait, that my expectation, if my expectation, I'm flying out on Tuesday, my expectation is that Tuesday I'm getting on an airplane and I'm flying to Colorado. Therefore, in expectation, the evidence of that in my life will be that right now there is a suitcase sitting out in my, in my room. That suitcase is open and there are things in it. I don't normally have things in a suitcase sitting out in my room. That's not the normal way that I live. Normally things are in drawers and such, but they're in a suitcase right now because there is an expectation. There is a evidence that something is about to happen. And because the ticket is bought and the arrangements are made and I, ex I have a full expectation of that which is to come, there are evidences of that in my life. I am living as if on Tuesday I'm going to get on a plane and go somewhere. That's faith. And from these two statements, we can begin to build a definitional framework of this idea. Faith deals with matters which are unseen, but have been told to me with the expectation that they are going to come to pass and thus will affect my life. Things such as Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. Things such as Christ's second coming. Things such as Christ's promises of provision and of care and of sovereignty and of protection. And the measure of faith in a man is the degree to which his belief in those unseen matters and those personal promises work themselves out in his daily life. So if I was sitting here today without any suitcase out and no bags packed, uh, most of you would say, well, that's pretty normal, right? You do that at about 10 o'clock before you leave the next morning. Okay, fine. But the idea being, if it's time to leave for the airport and I don't have a bag packed and I'm still in my pajamas and I haven't showered and I'm not ready and I haven't done anything with tickets and I haven't pre-registered or anything, well, you could conclude that I don't really believe I'm going anywhere. But because I believe I'm going somewhere, I make plans. I prepare. I think through things and I align my life with the expectation of what's going to happen. So faith cannot be measured then by how much a person says he thinks something is or is not true or he thinks something will or will not happen. Faith is rather measured by how much those unseen things play themselves out in the way that I'm living my life. And the world around us today gives us ample evidence of the difference between saying something and actually having faith in that thing. We have a country right now that is in the throes of um, fears that relates to climate. 
right? And uh, many in this country are desperate to convince us that the world is going to be destroyed by climate change in short order if we don't give them all, all of our power and all of our money. And they get up and they make those grand speeches with great swelling words of conviction and they write the books and they make the documentaries. And many of them probably think that they believe these things to be true. And many of those who hear them think that they believe these things to be true. And again, not debating the nitty gritty of climate change, just the idea of climate alarmism. But one of the reasons why many are not convinced is because while they say that all of these things are true, all of the people that are telling us that all of these things are true are still almost universally living in coastal cities, driving big cars, flying private jets, buying homes on the coast. And it makes us wonder, do they actually believe what they're saying? I mean, if I actually believed what they were saying, I wouldn't be buying a house on the coast. I'd be buying a house on a mountain. I'd be moving inland a little bit. And there's a difference, right, between what somebody says they believe and maybe even has convinced themselves they, they believe, but what they actually believe. Because while we can say we believe anything, Christian, what we do is going to be a pretty good indicator of what we actually believe, regardless of what we say. So Jesus taught in Luke chapter 6, verse 44, every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. If you want to identify the type of tree that you're dealing with, there's a pretty foolproof way to do it, and that is to assess its fruit. If I see what the tree produces, sometimes that would be the shape of the leaf or the type of bark, or in the case of a fruit tree, it's an easy one, right? The type of fruit. Oh, look, there's oranges on that tree. That's an orange tree. A thorn bush will never produce figs. A bramble bush will never produce grapes. The things that come out of your life invariably reveal what is inside of your heart. And you cannot cheat the system. If you want to know whether or not you truly believe something, if you want to know whether or not you actually believe something to be true, then look at the way you live your life. Look at the outworking, the fruit of your life. Whether or not it affects the way you live your life. And you will know without ambiguity whether or not you have faith in that thing. You can say that you believe those things that the Bible teaches, be it about the gospel or about sanctification or about God's authority or about laying up treasure in heaven, about God's protection or about God's provision or all of these things. But if the manner in which you live your life, the way that you position your life to be lived, operates in fundamental inconsistency with what the Bible teaches in this manner, to the degree that that disparity exists, to that same degree you can know that you have not actually translated what you know into what you believe into faith. Now, and as I'm saying this, uh, let, me, let me reassure you, all of us do this. I wish I could get into James chapter 2 today. I'm not going to be able to get into James chapter 2 today. Um, we are going to talk a lot more about James chapter 2 when we get to Genesis 22, which is where, where we see a merging between what James is teaching about faith and works and uh, Abram uh, 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 sacrificing his son Isaac. We might allude to it in Genesis 15, which is also there in James chapter 2. But as we think through this idea, what we'll understand is that we all have areas of our life where we struggle with faith. Most of us in here, by God's grace, have come to the place where we have actually put our full faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved from our sins. That's saving faith. But you know, you don't get all faith when you get saving faith. There's other things that you have to work through in your life trusting the Lord for. You've trusted the Lord to be saved. Praise the Lord. You're on your way to heaven because you are trusting in nothing but Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. But that doesn't necessarily mean you trust him fully with provision. You trust him fully for protection. You trust him fully as it relates to his teachings on laying up treasure in heaven. You trusted him fully in every area of your life as it relates to sanctification. And so if you're sitting here today saying, well, pastor, I feel really bad about this. Am I the only person that's dealing with this issue of faith? Uh, whatever the Holy Spirit might be laying on your heart, where there's an inconsistency in your life between what the Bible says and what you're doing, you're not the only one. We're all 
on that journey. And I'm not saying that to relieve anyone of, of the feelings of, of the need to re, re, respond to the Holy Spirit if he's convicting your heart. But I do say that to remind you that this is not me dropping the hammer on someone here. It's simply the case. Look, let's be honest. If you say you believe something, but the manner in which you're living your life works in, in, is operating in, in contradiction to what you say you believe, you might know it, but look, you don't believe it. You, it might be in your head and you might acknowledge verbally, mentally, assent to the fact that it is true, but you haven't actually invested your heart in it. Because if you were investing your heart in it, you'd live like it. Because the tree is known by its fruit. So our first point this morning is this then. Faith is the point when what I know becomes what I believe and so affects what I do. And that is the running definition that we've had for a long time now since we studied many years ago Hebrews 11 and then working through the Hebrew series. This is our running definition of faith at Legacy Baptist Church. Faith is when what I know becomes what I believe so that it affects what I do. Now, one more thing to say just briefly before we move on, and it goes back to that James 2 idea. While it is biblically apparent that the only way that I can know whether I have faith is by the actions that I'm committing, the idea is not that faith requires works. Much to the contrary, it is the idea that faith produces works. Faith does not require works. Faith produces works. Works are the fruit of faith. Faith is not the fruit of works. And these two ideas are mutually exclusive. If faith requires works, then in order to attain to the status of faith, I must first do certain things. And when I have done certain things, then I have attained unto the faith. But this subverts the entire promise or excuse me, the entire premise, that faith is something which I receive rather than do, right? It, it, it subverts the entire promise that faith is built upon the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It is the things that I hope for and have not yet seen that compel my faith and thus then compel my works. But if it's works first then that, that, that actually builds or establishes my faith, well, then, no, it's not the unseen. It is the things that I have done that creates faith in me. Not the things I'm trusting in, but the things I've done. And that's not what the Bible says. However, if faith produces works, then when I come to faith in something, the thing that validates in my heart and my mind that this faith is genuine is when I see the marks of that faith being lived out in my life in a manner in which I interact with the world. And again, that's uh, very simple. It's best expressed in James 2. I'm not going to get into James 2 today, but we will a little bit later. Um, and, and hopefully that, that idea will become more clear to you. Okay, so point one. Faith is the point when what I know becomes what I believe and so affects what I do. That's the definition of faith. When we are talking about faith, a legacy of faith, about a God who is worthy of our faith, this is what we are talking about. A legacy of men who were told things by God and they took God's word and they said, I will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That there's a hundred different reasons why I should not believe this promise that I cannot see, that I cannot touch, that I cannot taste, that I cannot feel. But I'm going to believe it anyway on the, uh, by virtue of the character of the one who has made the promise. The God who is worthy of my faith is a God who is in fact worthy of my faith. Therefore, I will trust in him and I will build my life upon his words even though I'm putting my trust, my hope, my expectation in that which I have not seen and which has not yet come to pass. And that's what we're talking about. And because of the testimony and works of our God, a God who is worthy of our faith, a God worthy to be believed, 
His promises are worthy of my attention, my loyalty, and my obedience, even my sacrifice, which we'll come to in a little bit. Now, as you walk away from this point, again, perhaps the Spirit of God is convicting you that your life does not well reflect faith in some way or the other. And if this is you, as we've already talked about this morning, at least in part, if you say, wow, there is an area of inconsistency, and I haven't mentioned any directly, but the Spirit of God has put his thumb on something in your life, and he's saying, there's a, there's a, 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 a thing here. You know that you're not actually walking in faith in this area of your life. You say you believe it, but your life reflects otherwise. The point of this conviction of the Holy Spirit is not that you would walk away saying, I've just got to do better. I've got to start doing the things necessary to show that I have faith. Well, no, right? Because it's not going to be your works that produce faith. It's going to be your faith that produces works. Faith does not naturally deal with actions. Faith is, uh, actions are an outworking of faith. Actions are the proof that I have faith. But faith itself is not naturally dealing with actions. Actions are a result of faith, a proof of faith, not the source of faith. The battleground then, if you're under conviction, if, uh, 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 this week or any other week, as you're dealing with some matter of faith, the battleground is not about what you're doing. What you're doing is showing that there's a battle happening. It's the symptom, not the cause. The battleground is in your heart, Christian. And God forbid that you would walk away and say, I just need more discipline. And discipline into your life something without actually submitting your heart to Christ first. Commit your heart to the commands of Christ. Actually commit yourself in faith to what Christ has said and watch as your life begins to bear the fruit of that faith. Make sure that your heart is where it needs to be because that's where the battle is raging. I've talked about this with salvation before, but it's just as, as applicable of an illustration to any area of faith. That when we see the things that are coming out of our life, right? For the unbeliever, that's the sins that they're committing. For us, maybe it's a, a falling short of faith as it relates to trusting the Lord or whatever it might be. That's a symptom of a cause. The cause is in the heart. The symptoms are what is coming out of us. I can take a Tylenol to make a fever go away when I have a fever, but I'm not fixing the problem. I'm only masking the symptoms. Until the infection is cleaned out or until the virus is removed from my body, that fever is going to come back when the Tylenol wears off because all that Tylenol functions to do is mask the symptoms of the problem. I can live my entire life just taking Tylenol, but it's never going to fix the problem. The infection has to be cleaned. The virus has to be killed. And at the point that that happens, then the fever will take care of itself. The fever will go away when the infection is gone. So we start in the heart. We, we, we look for the thing in our heart that is holding us back from believing Christ's promise. What is above Christ? What is, what is higher than him? What is it in my life that I am unwilling to yield or to, to invest in that is causing me to not bear the fruit in my life of the actions that are consistent with the faith that I claim? Deal with that in your heart and the actions will, will change. The fruit will produce if there's nothing between you and the Lord. Clean the inside and the outside will naturally follow. Point two. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Therefore, God's people walk by faith and not by sight. Now, I give you here a statement of fact and then an implication that's based upon that fact. The fact is God's people, or is it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Therefore, by implication, God's people, because they are God's people and desire to please God, will walk by faith and not by sight. The fact 
is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, where the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And this is, in fact, a pretty straightforward statement. The thing that pleases God in all of our lives, it is not actually, once again, coming back to the idea of doing, do you know that it's not actually the things you are doing or not doing that is the fundamental root of you pleasing God? The things that you are doing and not doing is not the root. Those things are manifestations. There are certain things that you can do where you can look and say, wow, that's not possibly in faith. That does not please God. But it is actually faith that pleases God. It is not actually works that please God. Only to the extent that the work is a production of faith in my life. And if that statement is somewhat foreign to you, if you say, Pastor, I don't, I don't quite get it. Again, when we hit James 2, we'll get there. That might be a little while, though. That's Genesis 22. We're only on 12. But I did preach a message. It was in May 10th of last year, so almost exactly a year ago. And it was a message on the balance between grace by faith and works. And the question that had come up within our Hebrew series at the time was the question, Pastor, if, if it is faith that pleases God, and if uh, grace is by faith, and grace is not of works, otherwise work is, is no more work, and, 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 and uh, 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 or, uh, uh, grace is not of works, and works is not, not of grace, and those are two separate things, then how is it that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things done in our bodies? If what, God, if what pleases God is faith, and faith is what matters to God, and grace is by faith, and grace is through the, the, the manner in which we live our lives, then how is it that, that we are warned about our works? And I answer that question in this message, and it gives a really good contrast um, between grace by faith and works. Now, that message was entitled Grace Part 4, Grace and Judgment. Again, it was our evening series. May 10th was when I preached it. It would be up on YouTube and Sermon Audio. And I encourage you to go back and listen to that message um, if you are wanting more um, about this, if you're confused or intrigued or unfamiliar with the concept. So then we accept this statement as truth Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Very similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The man who comes to God must believe that he is, that God is who he says he is, and that God will reward them that seek him, that God is who he says he is, and that God will do what he says he will do. And if this is in fact the case, if I believe that God is who he says he is, and I believe that he will do what he says he will do, then I am thus put in a position where I have a choice to make. On the one hand, I have the testimony of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The claims of this world, the promises of this world, the inclinations of my own heart to draw me to the things of this world, specifically because they're the things that I can see. They're the things that I can feel. They're the things that give me immediate gratification. They're the things that have a, a direct cause and effect. When I give to someone who has a need, I may not necessarily feel the exact cause and effect. I may walk away saying, well, that was nice. But I may not see the cause and effect. When I am forgiving to someone who's nasty to me, I may not see the direct cause and effect. I may have to wait 60, 70 years. I may have to wait uh, uh, decades to the end of my life to step into eternity before I can see the value of that investment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But if I just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I die, I get it now. I can see it now. I can, I can draw a direct line between cause and effect. And all of that every day is calling to every one of us, Christian, and saying, this is the promise. This is the good of this world. But by God's very design, the testimony of the world, the flesh, and the devil stands in direct and unreconcilable contradiction to the claims of God, the promises of God. And to this end, I can only believe one of these two. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of devils. 
At any given moment, in any given thought or action, you and I are either with God or against Him. And in consistency with our first point, it will not be the words out of my mouth which will fundamentally indicate where my faith lies, but rather the product of my life. Not that I will be sinless. None of us is. John warns in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves. The truth is not in us. But rather, I will direct my life in the trajectory of sanctification that each of us, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, will be compelled that we might know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Not continuing in sin that grace may abound, but abounding in grace in the day of my sin through confession and repentance and faith, restoring fellowship and walking in the light, realigned with my Savior. And when I have aligned my heart with that which God says, the product of my life will reflect it, and I will know that I am pleasing in his sight. The works testify to me of my heart of faith, but it is my heart of faith that is pleasing God. And this leads to another warning before we move on. Think through this carefully with me. It is not possible to have a faith that does not produce works. If I believe something, it will invariably produce in my life works that are consistent with that faith. However, it is possible to have works that are not a product of faith. So it is not possible to have a faith that does not produce works, but it is possible to have works that are not a product of faith. You and I are in church this morning. I don't know if you knew that. This is a work coming to church that is consistent with faith in God's word. The call of God not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, to provoke one another unto love and good works, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. It's a consistent work with faith. It's also a work that's consistent with faith that God desires us to grow, to be stretched in our faith, to be purified by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God, cleansing our lives and directing our hearts into sanctification. It may also be a work that is consistent in the lives of some in this room with faith in God as it relates to authority. That some of our children are here today and they are at church, perhaps not because they are fully invested in what the church is doing or they've come to maybe some not, not even full understanding of these things yet. Yet, it is consistent with the idea of honoring one's authority and that is a consistent fruit of faith. Perhaps you could think of other faith manifestations that coming to church could actually uh, um, produce in our lives. But just because the work of attending church is consistent with faith, is something that is often a product of one's faith, this does not necessarily mean that you are in church today because faith produced that work in you. There are plenty of other things that might have compelled you to come to church today other than faith in some element of God's word. Everyone who has faith in God's promises to assemble will be led to find God's people and assemble. Maybe it'll look like this church. Maybe it will look nothing like this church. But everyone who has faith in what God's word has said about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, about provoking ourselves to love and good works, about being a member of the body and a member in particular that we might, uh, uh, that, that we might profit with all. Every person who reads Romans, 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, Ephesians, is going to, uh, Hebrews, is going to seek out an assembly of believers because faith is going to produce in them the need and the longing to do so. However, plenty of people who have no faith at all are also compelled to church assemblies, aren't they? And that for any number of ulterior reasons. Maybe it's to uphold some tradition. What they're actually doing is they're putting, they're, they're, they're putting faith in the fact that this tradition matters. Not faith in God. They're invested in a tradition. Or maybe they're, they want to look like a good person in front of their family or their society. It's a pride issue. 
They have to save face. They have to uphold some, some, uh, some uh, testimony that they might have. Maybe they're coming to church specifically to attempt to earn favor with God. It's a self-righteousness issue where they're actually investing in church specifically so that they can show God, see God, I did things for you. Or maybe they're doing it so that they can feel morally superior to the people that are around them, so that they can judge others, so that they can walk out of this place and look around at all those people who didn't go to church today and say, wow, I'm a whole lot better than you are. I went to church this morning. All of those are also things that could compel someone to go to church. These people are doing the same work, but there's no faith there. The action that they're committing, though we might call it moral or society, societally and personally beneficial, is not actually a product of faith. It might very well make them a better person. It's certainly a better use of, of, of their time than a lot of other things. Well, depending on what church they go to, I guess. But if it's not being done in faith, simply put, it's not pleasing God. To this end, then, the compulsion of God's people through every generation has been not as much about the actions that we're doing, but the motivations to walk by faith and not by sight. You, I, I, we don't come together in church to learn what to do in the, in the purest sense of the word. We come to church to learn about the one who has called us to follow him. And then we follow him. And we learn how to follow him. We learn of our faith. To set aside the various carnal motivations or intentions that the world, the flesh, and the devil might present to us, regardless of how they, out, uh, how they work themselves out, how they manifest themselves in our lives. And instead, we fundamentally structure ourselves around intentional faith, a determination to believe that God is who he says he is, and that he will do what he said he will do, and I'm on his side. We sang that song this morning. Who is on the Lord's side? All four of those songs that we sang this morning. Who is on the Lord's side? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Revive us again. And then that final one, I am resolved no longer to linger. It was a, it was a, it was a song time of faith this morning, was it not? Of the promises of God outworking themselves into our lives in determination to exhort one another to get on God's side to be a usable and sanctified vessel for him and to be resolved to move forward in that faith. We didn't sing, I am resolved to go to church or I am resolved not to watch that certain thing on TV or I am resolved to, to uh, not, not say those certain words. Now, all of those things will be resolutions that we will work out in our lives in one way, shape, or form. But the resolution is that we, I'm resolved to follow Christ, to come out from among them and be separate, to take up my cross and follow him. It's a resolution unto faith because that's what pleases God. And this leads us to our next point. And also finally to the example in Genesis chapter 12 of Abram. In Hebrews, Paul begins at creation and he proceeds to trace all of the men and women whose lives bear testimony of the legacy of faith as they work themselves out from the Old Testament. Paul speaks of Abel, and then he speaks of Enoch, and then he speaks of Noah. All men whose actions reflected their conviction in the word of God, that they believed the word of God, and they acted in light of what God had told them. And following these men, we come to Abraham where Paul writes this concerning him in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. He says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which, should after, which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now these verses extend well beyond just Genesis 12, 1 through 9, and we know that because it also mentions Isaac and Jacob. However, it mentions them in passing, and we'll see if, if you continue in the text that, um, the, that, that Paul does continue to focus well on Abraham for a and Sarah for a little while longer to the extent that we know that, that he's still actually focusing on Abraham. But what we see in this passage 
is this. And we also see it in Genesis 12 by application. Abraham's faith in what God had told him compelled him into a mindset of personal sacrifice by which he was willing to set aside the things which were naturally expected, desires, or otherwise reasonable in his life in order to fully invest in the promises, the unseen promises that God had given to him. In other words, not only did Abraham show he had faith because what he knew became what he believed as it was manifest in what he did, he got up and he left. But in our third point, we find here that faith, Abraham's faith was, and faith in fact is, sacrificial. Now when I had initially written out these points to be used at the end of last week's message, I had put down faith is often sacrificial. But then I thought about it and I realized that that qualification is unnecessary. Faith is not often sacrificial. In fact, faith is always sacrificial. Faith will not always ask me to give up what I have. Abraham was asked to give up some things. He was asked to give up his family, his land, uh, the, the protections and provisions, the culture of his own family group of Terah and Haran. He was asked to be a stranger, to live in tents for the rest of his life and his son's life and his son's son's life, to have no true home in that sense. So he was asked to yield some things, but he was also not asked to yield everything, right? As we look at Abraham's life, we find that he was a prophet, that he was an excessively wealthy man, uh, that he was so wealthy, in fact, that he was able to gather his servants and actually go and defeat a nation <laughs> with, with, with just the number of servants he had because he had a sufficient number of servants to literally make an army. The dude was rich. And he was not just rich, but he was powerful. Kings feared his name. When Abimelech took Sarah, and then his wives were made barren, and he gave Sarah back to Abraham, and they had the conversation, we'll get there. He could not again, his wives would, would remain barren until such time as Abraham, as a prophet, prayed for him. Abraham had influence, he had power in the region. Kings and nations feared him. So faith was not, he was not asked to live a life of destitution and asceticism. He was not like Elijah or John after him who would uh, live in the wilderness and eat locusts and wild honey and, and, and um, be an ascetic for his entire life. And yet, though he was not asked to give everything up, faith did invariably call him to put those things on the altar, to be willing to yield them to hold everything that he had under God so that if there was anything in his life all the way down to his only begotten son, to his beloved son, if God asked him by faith, if God said, by faith you must yield your son in order to have what I have for you, Abraham had to be ready. It had to be on the altar. He had to be willing. Because faith is sacrificial. Christian, God owes you nothing. And more than that, when the kingdom of God comes in conflict with the kingdoms of this world, it is very possible that this will give way to a measure of loss of the things of this world if you choose to follow faith. When the things of this world come in direct contradiction to faith, Yes, the things of this world must be on that altar, whether that be houses or lands or family or whatever it might be. And this is true. Circumstance and time may or may not ask you to yield those things. Many of you have come to the faith and you've lived these years of your life and to be quite honest, you've had to do very little as far as material sacrifice for your faith. 
you, you, you have your house and you have your bank account and you have your job and you have your family and all is, is quite well. Faith, time and circumstance may or may not ask these things of you. But faith will compel you to put it on the altar. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Now we live in the United States of America. And for the majority of the past 250 years, most Christians have been blessed to not need to choose between family and faith or employment or faith and life and faith. However, there are some, even in this room, who have had to make those sacrifices. You have had to fundamentally alter relationships with people in your life that you would not otherwise desire to. You would desire to maintain that relationship, but you can't because faith compels you to do otherwise. You've had to leave a job, change your living conditions in order to remain faithful to God and his word. And I don't seek to minimize your hurt or your struggle or the sorrows of those things that you have had to yield on this earth for the sake of faith. I don't minimize that at all. So please, please don't, don't think that I am. But that doesn't change the fact that we know very little of the sacrifices of faith as it relates to history, as it relates to what we read about in the book of Acts, or what we read about in, the book of, uh, in, in Fox's book of Martyrs or in the Martyr's Mirror, or what we read about today in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia as it relates to the kinds of sacrifices that are having to be made that men may follow, men and women might follow the faith. But whether you have been asked to yield these things, to, to, to give up these things or not, faith is fundamentally sacrificial. Just because the circumstances of our time and history have perhaps not demanded them of us, this does not mean that God does not ask them to be on the altar. So that if there came a day where anything in your life was asked to be yielded for the sake of following God's word and way by faith, faith expects this yielding. One final point. Faith always precedes blessing. The final verse that we read in Hebrews 11 just a minute ago, not the final verse of Hebrews 11, but in he Hebrews 11 verse 10, that final verse we read says this about Abraham. For he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Faith is sacrificial, but that doesn't mean faith is some sort of masochistic endeavor that thrives on suffering. Faith is sacrificial, but it is not a sacrifice in the sense of loss. It is a sacrifice in the sense of investment. If I decided, because of the way the economy is going, to put my money into precious metals, and I took all of the, the funds that I have, the liquid assets that I have, and I put them into precious metals, <clears throat> I cannot go to the grocery store, drop an ounce of silver to pay for my milk and eggs. It's not going to work. I have lost the liquid nature, the fungible nature of, those, of that money. But while I have sacrificed the capacity of that money to be used functionally right now, I have done so with an eye toward a better return tomorrow. It is an investment in something more. So yes, I have sacrificed something in that that money is not liquid, it is not fluid, it is not something that I can just go and drop down on the counter anymore as I could yesterday. But that doesn't mean it's a loss. It is in fact instead an investment. And on the authority of God's word, the sacrifice of things on this earth, on the grounds of faith, the things that I do in this life, compelled by faith for the Lord, the things that I must thus sacrifice in order to do so, 
Those things are not a loss, but rather it's a sacrifice unto investment, investment in something much greater, in some and not just something much greater, but, but if I may make this very clear, it is not just that I'm investing in something much greater, it is that I'm investing in something far more real. And a, a far more eternal weight of glory. Abraham left houses, families, lands. He dwelled in tents far apart from cities for the rest of his life. And he did so by faith. His faith took him on a journey for a promise of something much greater and more real than the city of Haran or the city of Egypt. He sought for a city with immovable foundations, a city which would not pass away. He sought to, to invest his time and his effort into building his home in a city that could not be torn down, in a city that could not be conquered, a city with ha which hath foundations whose builder and maker was God. Some of us have become a little bit more politically active in the last few years. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But there is something futile about it, isn't there? That you put your time and your effort into this to save what? And for how long? Because, you know, eventually, one way or the other, the United States of America will cease to be. Whether that's by being conquered, whether that is by collapsing from inside and balkanizing into many little states like Eastern Europe has done a bunch of times. Have you ever looked at a map of Eastern Europe before 1900 and a map of Eastern Europe today? Very different. And by the way, if you look about every 20 years between there, each map is going to look very, very different. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Cities come, cities go. They rise, they fall. And the time and the investment that, that, that great men have put into building these things lasts for so long, but then it goes away. And Abram lived in tents, and he wandered as a stranger because he was convinced that the cities of this world were not exactly that which is fully worth his time and his investment. Strangers on a journey, sojourners in a land, heading to a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, and every minute that I invest into that city is, is investment into a city which will never change, which will not go away, which will not be teared down, which will not be conquered, which will not collapse into moral decay. And so Abram looked around and he said, there's worth there. Now, again, I'm not saying that there's not worthiness for us to invest in the things of this life. We have children. We have grandchildren. There are reasons to, to fight for those things as well. But priorities have to be in the right place. I mentioned a minute ago the eternal weight of glory. That phrase comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16 says, For which cause we faint not? But though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us a far more eternal, uh, excuse me, far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Right? That's faith. And on the day that Abram passed from this life to the next, after 150 years of sojourning, 75 of those living in Ur and Haran, then 75 wandering in the desert, living in tents as a stranger in a foreign land, with a foray into Egypt and the like, he actually passed into the city that he'd been investing in his whole life. He died, and he stepped into his reward, not a sacrifice unto loss, those 150 years of his life, a sacrifice unto investment, which then he received when he passed into glory. 
And so he found his investment, that city, that he was actually built, working on building into at the end of his journey, not as the journey itself. And this is the essence of faith as the Bible presents it, Christian. That God has made us promises that faith pleases God, that whatsoever is not of faith is sin, and that as we walk by faith, we are building for ourselves treasure in heaven. Paul describes it as gold, silver, and precious stones. And every moment that we spend investing in faith, whatever faith looks like, whatever faith compels you to give, whatever, whatever faith does not compel you to give, you walk moment by moment by faith. And as you do so, you're investing in a different city, a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, that which cannot be taken away from you. As Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, a place where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves cannot break through nor steal. And Christian, where your treasure is, is where your heart, or where your, your treasure is, there will your heart be also, right? If you are blessed, Christian, to live 80, 100 years in this mortal body upon this rock that we call earth, that's a good life after which we step into eternity. And as Jim Elliott said so eloquently in his day, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. When at once we have a clear perspective on life and eternity, a life on the altar in exchange for a promise, an eternal promise, a temporary life on an altar, 60, 70, 80, 90 years on the altar in exchange for an eternity of promises. Well, that's about the best investment one can make. And that's faith. But here's the thing. The investment will only make sense to you and I by faith. God will not open a window into heaven Say, Here, he, here's what I have for you. Take a peek so that you can know why you're supposed to be doing these things. No. Nope. God says, you got to trust me. He brings us to the edge of that cliff. And there's nothing but clouds below me. And God says, at the bottom of that is your reward. And I say, well, God, can you just move the clouds aside a little bit so I can see it before I jump? And God says, no, you got to trust me. And if you trust me, you'll have it. And I say, well, I do trust you. Just move the clouds. And God says, no, trust me. Well, can you at least show me? Can, can, can I have a little bit of that reward first? No, no, you got you to take the step first. Then comes the reward. Faith always comes before the blessing. The Spirit of God does give us a taste, does he not? Through, through the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You do have a taste of heaven. God's been gracious to give that to you. But he has not given us an intrinsic understanding of the kind of joy, the kind of rest, the kind of peace which has been reserved for the faithful. But instead, we have a promise. The promise was first given in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, but it's quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. He says, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know what? That sounds pretty good. Do I know what that means? Pastor, you spend all day studying the word of God. What does that mean? I don't know. But I know I want it. I, I hath not seen, ear has not heard, which means we can't relate ourselves to it. Have you ever noticed that? that we can really only relate ourselves to the things we've seen and heard. When people try to invent future machines or whatever it might be, they're always kind of related to what they already understand, right? Aliens, they look like an amalgamation of like seven different bugs. Future, fu future flying cars or whatever it might be always, always kind of look like cars like we think of them today or airplanes like we think of them today. We don't really have a concept to think outside the box in that way. Every once in a while, there's, there's, there's a weirdo that does and he changes the world, but, but um, that's not typical, right? 
We relate ourselves to what we understand. So if the Bible says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath come into the heart of man what God hath re prepared for them that love him, I can't tell you what heaven's going to look like. But I can tell you that the reward will be something where anything you do in this life to invest in that will seem like peanuts compared to what you get on the other side. But you've, the, on, the only way that we can relate ourselves to that is by, by faith. It's the only way we can do it. We can draw the streets of gold and the gates of pearl, and, you know, that's fine. But to be quite honest, if you've ever talked to any kid about heaven after showing them the streets of gold and the gates of pearl, people sitting on clouds, playing harps, whatever, whatever, whatever picture of heaven people have, you know what children say? Heaven's going to be boring, right? Because we, we try to create this picture of wealth and lavishness and beauty, but that's not, it's not, it doesn't connect. Now, heaven won't be boring. I guarantee you. The only thing that you will ever feel, I don't know what heaven's going to look like. I don't know what we're going to do. Are we just going to be really on our knees all day and night praising God? I don't know. But you know what? If we are, if that's what heaven is, I guarantee you there will not be one iota of one millisecond of that time, of that timeless eternity, which iota of millisecond won't even exist, but there will not be even one millisecond of that timeless eternity where you will feel anything other than absolute satisfaction. I can guarantee you that. And I don't know what that's going to look like and I don't know what that's going to feel like because my eyes haven't seen it and my ears haven't heard it and it hasn't even entered into my heart, but I know I want it. And if I want it, then I know how to get it. Faith. The promises of God invested into my life today for the reward of tomorrow. This is the faith that Hebrews 11 teaches us that Abraham had. A faith manifest in the fact that he left his life and his family in order that he might pursue the will of God for him. He did so with a vision of another city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. And at the end of his days, he was put into a grave, but he actually went into his reward. The reward of one who left all and followed God's word. The same reward that waits for you and I today as we Trust and obey. So the question is this this morning, where is your faith today? Are you living in faith? Have you come to the faith? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you investing in the, the city that is to come that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God? Or are you so busy investing in this life that you are falling short of investing in that which is for eternity? Don't get it mixed up, Christian. Say, well, ah. Oh, God's asking me to give up that thing. No, he's asking you to invest that thing to something much, much greater. But we can only know that by faith. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.